like the golden sun ascending, breaking through the gloom of night, on the earth his glory spending, so that darkness takes to flight. Thus my Jesus from the grave and death's dismal, dreadful cave rose triumphant Easter morning as the early day was dawning. Thanks to thee, O Christ victorious. Thanks to thee, O Lord of life. Death hath now no power o'er us. Thou hast conquered in the strife. Thanks because thou didst arise and hast opened paradise. None can fully sing the glory of the resurrection story. Welcome to this broadcast of the Calaveras Presbyterian Church Resurrection Day service coming from Angels Camp, California. We greet you in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. We pray your celebration will be a joyful one today, despite the restrictions which have been placed on all of us in this difficult time. We apologize for the uh, slight glitch as we began our service this morning, technical difficulties. We hope you're back with us. Don't forget to tune in next Sunday morning for our online Sunday school lesson via Zoom. And that's at 9.30 a.m. led by Chris Jack. Tonight we encourage you to continue our video study of Romans 8 using Dr. Derek Thomas's lecture at ligonier.org slash learn slash series. Our lesson for today is number 10 entitled No Expense Spared. It's a fitting study to end our commemoration of the holy events we celebrate this weekend. Our hymn of the month for April is Hallelujah for the Cross. Let's sing that now as we open our service. Good morning to you all. He is risen. He is risen indeed. 
you please rise for our call to worship this morning? Our call to worship, as all of the readings today will be taken from that great resurrection chapter, John 20. The call to worship is John 20, from verses 19 and 20. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, our hearts are filled with joy this morning as we remember that glorious day, that day that gives meaning and purpose to all of life, that day that was the center point of human history. We praise you that you have called us into your presence. We ask that you will show us Jesus as he stands among us, as he proclaims peace even today. We give you the glory in this hour of worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God's greeting, John 20, verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. For our hymn of praise this morning, turn to 276 in your hymnals, Up from the Grave He Arose. 276. Let's now turn to our reading of God's will for us this morning, which will again be from John 20, this time verses 24 through 31. John 20, 24 through 31. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, 
and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Well, Thomas is an interesting character. This was a man who was devoted to Jesus, but you don't get the picture that he was the uh, most jolly or the most imaginative of Jesus' disciples, maybe even a little bit of, a, of an Eeyore. When Jesus, if you remember, when he announced that he was going to Jerusalem before Palm Sunday, Thomas sees only the practical side of the danger. And he responds, well, we might as well go and die with him. And then when Jesus in John 14 talks mysteriously about going ahead and preparing a, a place for his disciples, and he says that they, that they will follow him, um, rather than being intrigued and excited by this mysterious statement. He responds that he has no idea where Jesus is going, and so how can he follow him? So Thomas seems to have been a, uh, a very practical disciple, a practical man. So when he happened to be gone from the disciples on the first Easter, and he get, didn't get to see the risen Lord, he says to them, well, excuse me if I'm just a little bit incredulous, but Jesus showed up, and he didn't walk in in the normal way. He's here one movement, moment, and then poof, he's gone and he keeps doing that, I saw him die. Excuse me if I'm a little incredulous, right? He just vaporizes through walls. You see, though Thomas had walked with the Savior as he calmed storms and as he uh, turned water to wine and he raised Lazarus from the dead and as he um, created food for 5,000, he had not fully grasped the central message of the Gospel of John. And the, the, the point of the Gospel of John that John tries to get across from the first verse even was that Jesus was divine, that he was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John had told us. And Thomas, he has difficulty resting in the divine provision of his Savior because of his need for observational proof. He's like a scientist who, rather than recognizing that Jesus is the Creator, and that as such, he is outside of the box of the universe, that he's literally supernatural. He can't believe in the resurrection because that's just not scientifically possible. Normal people don't die and then appear again, and normal people don't walk right through walls. And the point of this story for Thomas and for us is that Jesus is not normal people. This is the resurrected Lord, and Jesus is the first of a new creation. He's the Lord of all things, including life and death. And what Thomas needed to learn, and what we need to learn, is that because of the resurrection, because of Easter, nothing will be in the same in this world ever again. Thomas said, I need to see it to believe it. And he got to see it, didn't he? And he has a very important position in the book of John because he's actually, if you think about it, he's the first person in the gospel to look at Jesus and directly address the word God to him. So his, his confession kind of bookends the entire book, doesn't it? John 1, Jesus is God. And uh, at the end here, he's declared God. Only God, Thomas recognizes, could have this power over life and death. So I think our, our command today from this passage is to see by faith this same truth that Thomas eventually saw, namely that Jesus is God. He's in control. And if Jesus could rise from the dead, then Jesus is the creator. And he's capable of creating things in your life and in my life that are way outside of the box. And things like a silly old virus are inconsequential. They're nothing, right? This world has met the next world and is undergoing a radical transformation because of Easter. So let us now go to our God and let's confess how often we fail at seeing that Jesus has our times, he has our life in his hands. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you are the sovereign creator of all things. How quickly we forget this fact, Lord. How quickly we worry and fret over the things of this life. Lord, because of your resurrection, which we celebrate today so joyfully, these things 
are, these things of this world are giving away to a new order of existence. And gracious Father, you have told us that uh, from your throne in heaven, you care for and you feed the birds and you clothe the lilies of the field with more beauty even than Solomon. And you promise to watch over us and to see us through difficult times. And Holy Spirit, you inspired the psalmist as well, who tells us that he has never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging bread. And so, Holy Trinity, we ask you today that you would forgive us of not resting in these facts, that you would give us the confession of Thomas, our Lord and our God. And now, Lord, we kneel before you, and we ask that you would also forgive us for the sins that we silently confess before you now. We pray these things in the power of our resurrected Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you please rise for God's assurance of pardon? Taken from John 20, 17 through 18. Jesus said to her, Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Well, you have seen the Lord, you have confessed your sins to this Lord who by his death and by his resurrection has paid for your sin, has given you new life. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. Your sins, my sins are forgiven. And all of God's people responded, thanks be to God. For our hymn of thanksgiving, please turn in your hymnal to 277. Christ the Lord is risen today.
sentence in the back, the Westminster Confession of Faith, page 867. I figured it would be appropriate today to read chapter 32 of the state of men after death and of the resurrection of the dead. I'll wait till you get there. People of God, what do you believe of the state of men after death and of the resurrection of the dead? The bodies of men after death return to dust and see corruption, but their souls, which neither die nor sleep, having an immortal subsistence, immediately return to God who gave them, the souls of the righteous being then made perfect in holiness, are received into the highest heavens, where they behold the face of God in light and glory, waiting for the full redemption of their bodies. And the souls of the wicked are cast into hell, where they remain in torments and utter darkness, reserved to the judgment of the great day. Besides these two places, for souls separated from their bodies, the scripture acknowledgeth none. At the last day, such as are found alive shall not die, but be changed, and all the dead shall be raised up with the self-same bodies, and none other although with different qualities, which shall be united again to their souls forever. The bodies of the unjust shall by the power of Christ be raised to dishonor, the bodies of the just by his spirit unto honor, and be made conformable to his own glorious body. Well, if you would bow with me now, we will have our congregational prayer. Father, we come before you again today on this beautiful Easter morning with praise on our lips. Lord, as so much of this world is caught in the grip of fear, we, your people, are not afraid. We are joyful. We are triumphant. Lord, we see Jesus standing among us as he was among the disciples saying, peace be with you. Lord, we feel the presence of your Holy Spirit guiding and directing our paths. And Lord, this Easter morning, we wish to live our lives in the light of the certainty of your resurrection, we ask that you would give us the eyes of faith that come from such certainty. You, O oh Lord, are sovereign. You are glorious. You are efficient in your planning and in your execution of the events of this world. And Lord, though we don't always know the details of why you do things, we always know the who of the situation. We know you. We know you in your infinite goodness and your mercy even as we see you also and know you in your justice and your wrath against unbelief. Lord, this, uh, this uh, virus, this economic difficulty, these lockdowns, we recognize they're all part of your sovereign will to wake up a slumbering people. And so we thank you for these difficulties. And more than thank you for them, Lord, we ask that you would make them as bad as they need to be until we learn the lessons that you're trying to teach us. Lord, we ask particularly that you would end the scourge of abortion in this land, which kills exponentially more than this virus does and in more cruel ways. Lord, we recognize that the times we live in are so opaque to those who do not see with the eyes of heaven, who do not see history through the lens of the resurrection. And as we see this, we recognize that this is an uphill battle that we as your people face. So we ask, Lord, that you would give your church perseverance and energy, that you would give us a heart of compassion and a renewed commitment to missions. We ask that you would help us to love those who would hate us and would hate you and hate the message. We pray for uh, peace in the body between faithful churches, between faithful denominations. We ask that you would help us to find and stand with allies in these troubled times. And Lord, at the same time, we ask that you would give us the courage and the wisdom to recognize those churches that are actually wolves in sheep's clothing, that are enemies of the gospel. We pray for our fellow churches in this and the surrounding counties. We ask that you would bless them, Lord, as they are faithful, that you would discipline them as they are not. We pray this thing, same thing for our own church, Lord. We ask that the cry of our heart in this church would would be a cry of always reforming, that it would always be on our lips. 
We ask that our love for you would never grow cold. Show us where our faults are, where our sins are, where we need to draw closer to you. Father, before we come to you with particular and personal petitions this morning, we want to pray for a particular corporate and national concern that I know is growing on many of our hearts. Lord, your word has so much to say about freedom, and our nation once knew those lessons inside and out, but it is becoming increasingly obvious that as a people we are ignorant of the biblical conception of freedom. Your church is in danger then again, once again, from overreach of the state. We are ignorant, Lord, as a people. We are ignorant of our history as a free people. We are ignorant of our constitution. We are ignorant of what your word says about the extent and about the limits of the authority of the state. We don't know how to apply Romans 13 in a biblical way, it seems. And because of this ignorance, Lord, we are once again courting tyranny in this land and in the world. And so, Lord, we pray for a revival of education. We pray first for a revival of good education and theology in your churches. We pray that the concepts of biblical government that our founders knew so well due to their study of your word that they built into the foundations of our nation. Lord, we pray that we pray for a revival of that kind of knowledge. We would want to remember, Lord, that any nation that is not founded on your law is doomed to failure. And Lord, it is, there's no question about it, but we as an American people have come to despise your law in recent generations. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would teach us again to have a love for your law, that you would uh, once again give us a hunger for your word, and that we ask, Lord, that you would revive true education in our schools. Let true history be taught again, and biblical economics and biblical government. For, Lord, how can we hope to elect uh, worthy leaders, ministers of yours in this fall, when we're so ignorant of the criteria needed for leadership? And so we pray for a revival of learning. We ask that you would bless the teachers who are in our midst, who labor so valiantly. We pray for Anna and Tanya and Holly and Mandy and... Carlinda and Ethan and Victoria and Dave and all of the homeschool parents, all the parents who now are homeschooling. Lord, we ask that you would bless the Christian school in a mighty way, that you would uh, protect her numbers, protect her finances. And Lord, we pray for the students in our land who we prayed for last week, who are home now, who may be some of them home with abusive parents, drunkards or using parents. Lord, they feel less safe at home than they did at school. And so we ask, Lord, that you would protect them, that you give repentance in those families, safety to those children, that you would convict everyone of sin in these situations, that you would rescue those children. We ask that you would strengthen those children, cause them to maybe to turn to neighbors whom they can trust. And Lord, we once again uh, offer the services of the people of this church um, to the lost and the hurting in this time. We pray for all of the women of this church who are missing their fellowship with one another. We uh, pray, Lord, for uh, the men of this church as well who are uh, contemplating um, the need to provide for their families. We pray for their businesses, for their finances. We think of certain businesses uh, that require contact. We think of uh, Pierre and Ethan's Karate Studios. We again praise you for the technology that enables us to have this worship service even, but also enables Uh, classes to go on in effective ways. But uh, we just pray, particularly as the Joubert's have most recently started their school, Lord, that you would, and they've been doing wonderful things in the lives of their students. We ask, Lord, that you would just bless and continue that mission field. And Lord, as our deacons may be called upon in coming months to aid your people, we ask again that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them adequate funding to meet the challenge. And Lord, finally, we want to remember our brothers and sisters around the world um, who look at our sequestering here in America and they think, they must think, you think you have troubles. Lord, there are brothers and sisters who are persecuted daily, who are martyred daily. Lord, we ask that as we are embroiled in our own difficulties that we would not forget them. We ask that you would bless them and give them comfort today, that you would strengthen them um, with the message of Easter, which is proclaimed In all lands today, Lord, we just give you the glory in all these things. And Lord, as there are many more unspoken prayer requests, you know them, we give them into your care. 
We ask all of these things in the strong name of the risen Lord. Amen. Well, for our hymn of preparation, you should have, CPC people should have received an insert and it will come on the screen as well. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Time for our children's message. All right, children, so quiet down, pay attention. All right, today we're going to spend, kids, the whole message looking at gardens. Now, I've been to different kinds of beautiful gardens. Have you been to beautiful gardens before? Yeah, there are. Been to, back in the old days when, when your mother and I, when Mrs. Mose and I were traveling, we'd been to lots of gardens around the world, ornate gardens in Paris and cool gardens full of weird spiders and Indonesia, flower gardens in Holland. You ever been to a Japanese sand garden? They're super beautiful. They're just, they're just sand. And you, you rake them, and you rake them into beautiful patterns. Very beautiful, very organized. I love them. Another place called the Garden of the Gods in Hawaii. It's beautiful. People have stacked all these stones up on the island of Lanai. Beautiful gardens. And gardens have all one thing in common, don't they? What's, what's in common with a garden? They're places of what? What do you say? Plants. Yeah, they're often plants, although they're zoological gardens too, but gardens are, gardens are places of life 
and they're places of order and they're places of beauty and peace. But I went to a weird garden once in Ireland, a garden at Blarney Castle, and you know what it was? It was a poison garden. Poison garden. Only thing they had growing in that garden was hemlock and wolfsbane and poison ivy and poison sumac, all the most poison, poisonous plants of the world. And they have signs everywhere, don't touch anything. It's a poison garden, right? So usually gardens are places of life, but in this case, that garden was a place of death. Everything growing in that place could kill you. Well, gardens and seeds and planting, they're used a lot as metaphors in the Bible. You know what metaphors are? That's kind of a big word. You know what a metaphor is? It's a symbol, right? It's a symbol, basically. It represents something. So a garden is a good metaphor for your life. And who do you think the gardener would be then in that metaphor? Christ would be the gardener. Very good, right, right. And if Christ is the gardener of your life, good seeds from the Bible have been planted and you're gonna grow amazing spiritual crops and spiritual fruits. But if the lies of Satan take hold in your life, then you're gonna end up with Spiritual poison ivy and poison sumac everywhere. Jojo just had a bad case of poison, I, uh, poison oak a few weeks ago. Poor little guy was all swelled up. Yeah, can you imagine talking about poison ivy of the heart, poison oak of the heart. Gardens need rich soil, and they need sunlight, and they need water to grow. And so in the analogy, what would your heart need then to grow? It would need Jesus, it would need, it would need Christ, it would need the Trinity, it would need um, watering of the word, right? It would need fellow believers in the body of Christ to survive and grow, right? That analogy just goes on and on. And so we're gonna talk about real gardens and real events in the sermon, but I just want you to remember as we're listening to that, that those gardens, they point to realities. They're a good, they're a good analogy, they point to realities, and the garden that we're talking about then is the garden of your heart, right? Garden of your heart. And metaphors are hard to grasp sometimes, but you can do it, right? So let's do some good concentration. I think Mina and Vaughn, your parents said you guys were going to join, so you can have your concentration hats on now. That'll be great. All right. Well, for the rest of you, let's take our Bibles, go back to John 20, and let's read now the sermon text, John 20, verses 1 through 23. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. <clears throat> then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had laid, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. 
Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you will hold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing passage of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for uh, the drama that we see unfolding here. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to see your truths, which are in these words. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my wife, Tanya, loves to garden. And given the chance, I think there is nothing that she would rather do than be out on the property, digging in the dirt, planting flowers, laying stone pathways. Her Easter flowers are in full bloom right now. In fact, out on the arbor that I can see through that window, there are hundreds of little rosebuds popping out, even this morning. And in that arbor, she has a sign that she probably got from Helen Thurston, from you, Helen Thurston, that sign reads, one is nearer God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on the earth. And there is a lot of truth in that statement when you think about it. And in fact, I want to use that statement as the thesis statement for this Easter message. One is nearer God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on the earth. Like I said to the, kid, the, to the kids, the uh, imagery of gardens is extremely common in scripture from uh, creation to the descriptions of the promised land to uh, the Song of Solomon to many places in the prophets to the events that happen in the go uh, gospels to Revelation, as descriptions of the new heaven and the new earth. But there are specific gardens that are mentioned in Scripture, and I want to look at those today. I want to look at Eden, at Gethsemane, and at the garden that housed the tomb, which Jesus was placed into. All of these gardens and the events which happen in them are fundamental to the Christian story. And as we look at them, we see the presence of each member of the Trinity in each of those gardens. And we feel the heart of God at work in the garden of our lives. So one should be nearer God's heart in that garden, the garden of your heart, than anywhere else on earth. So first we'll take a look at Eden. In the beginning, the earth was formless and void. And we're told that the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the dark chaos. But we see immediately that the creator had a will for the chaos, and he spoke a word, a word that we are later told is Christ. Christ is the word. Christ the word began his work, and space and time began. And at his command, by the power of the hovering spirit, massive galaxies were formed. Beautiful flowers dotted fresh, green, unspoiled fields, and the earth and the sea and the sky were teeming with wildlife, with life. The springtime of the world was born, and we read that God saw that it was good, and the Lord placed the crown of his creation, mankind, made in his own image, in the center as he breathed life and as he breathed spirit into him. And he gave men and women a purpose, and their purpose was what? It was to steward the earth, to take that pure Edenic dawn, and through their joyful labor, a labor that was to be supported by the spirit, Man was to submit his will, and he was to cultivate all things into a garden, perfecting it, a perfect ordering of the thoughts, words, and deeds of all creation into the unified worship of the creator. As I'm looking out the window right now and green fields and there's a horse out there, it's uh, easy for me to imagine that beautiful, unstained world. Again, I'm so thankful for living in Calaveras County. But as we would expect from such a magnificently creative God, the garden that he actually wanted wasn't Eden. Because if Eden was all that we knew, then yes, we would know God in his creativity, we would know God in his goodness, we would even know God um, somewhat in his grace because he didn't have to make us in the first place. But he wanted us to know more than those things about himself. There was another garden that the story of history was leading towards. Eden was just a stepping stone. For in God's providence, Satan, ever the destroyer, would seek to sow weeds and return that garden to chaos. And mankind, wishing to be a god himself, rather than being satisfied with being the steward and being the gardener, 
that he was designed to be, he committed the seed sin of all sins. And what did he do? Well, he refused to submit his will in the garden to the will of the Father. And so he was cast out of the garden. He lost the blessings of Eden. You know that, that some of you I know mentioned in messages that you were going to have your own Easter sunrise uh, service outside. We had one of those today. And there's that thrill when you, when you go out there in the early morning or when you're, you, know, you smell the pines in the high Sierras or you're feeling a brisk breeze as you're standing in waves in Monterey Bay. You get, a, you get a thrill and you get a longing, at least I do, a thrill or a longing for something that you, you can't quite put your finger on. And I'm convinced, convinced that that's the, that's the memory of Eden that's imprinted in our souls. And Adam lost that. He lost the perfect garden. But immediately, a promise was made to him. And it was a spring promise. It was a, it was a, a new creation promise. It was, a, it was an Easter promise that a son of man would come one day as a second Adam, a Messiah, and that unlike his father, he would be a faithful gardener who would submit his will perfectly. And then, of course, we have the whole uh, story of is Israel that proceeds from that moment, unfolds in the scriptures. And as we look at the Old Testament, the cultivated land is always, uh, always a theme that we see. We have see land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and it's covered with cultivated vines. It's a, it's a garden picture when we think of the promised land. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are called out to this promised land. Um, Moses leads Israel out of a dark chaos towards the promised land. Joshua, whose name in Greek is Jesus, in case the metaphor was not obvious enough, he leads the people into the land where all will be ordered by David, the king, ultimately, and a temple is built that's decorated with garden symbolism. All of this great story was by way of symbolism. It was all to point us to something, to somewhere, to someone, and to someone. All the long passages of the Old Testament point us to Jesus the gardener and point us to another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the second garden I want to look at. This is a garden where, once again, the gardener was asked like Adam, to submit his will to the creator. And Adam fell in the garden, but Jesus did not. Once again, in this garden, we have the will of the Father, and we have the agency of the Son, don't we? But what of the Spirit? Was he present? What was the role of the Holy Spirit in Gethsemane? And I think to answer this, we need to think on something for a moment. Yes, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, he knew what was happening in Gethsemane. He's the Word. He's the master gardener who created the Word, the world in the first place. But Jesus in his humanity still had to go through the Garden of Gethsemane, and we talked about this in the Good Friday message. Many Christians assume that the miracles that Christ did, that his perfect obedience in this life and his victory in Gethsemane were because of his divine nature. But Orthodox Christian theology does not teach that the humanity of Jesus was gobbled up by his divinity. In fact, it's a heresy to say that Christ's divine nature took the place of his human soul. The great Puritan minister and Oxford professor, John Owen, in fact, he made the bold statement that the only singular immediate act of the Son of God, the divine second person on the human nature of Christ, was the decision to take it into subsistence with himself in the incarnation. And, and Owen uh, argued that every other act upon Christ's human nature, including his victory in the garden, was done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ performed his miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit, not immediately by his own divine power. In other words, the divine nature acted not immediately by virtue of the hypostatic union, but immediately by means of the Holy Spirit. And so again, I think we see there's a great parallel between Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane, isn't there? The Holy Spirit was hovering over the activity that the Son was doing in both gardens. Christ's humanity needed the Holy Spirit. Christ's inseparable companion during his earthly ministry as a true man was the Holy Spirit who hovered over him. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. That was the cause of the incarnation. Christ received the Spirit without measure, we're told in John 3, 34. 
The Spirit descended at Jesus' baptism, Matthew 3, 16. The Spirit sustained him at the temptation in the wilderness. Jesus quotes from Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And Matthew 12, 18 and Acts 10, 38 tell us that Christ performed miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit. And like his death, Christ's resurrection is attributed to the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 11. And by it, he was declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of holiness, Romans 1, 4. So again, I think the point is made. As in Eden, all three members of the Trinity were present in Gethsemane. The will of the Father, that Jesus should die. The power of the Spirit, that Jesus should die. And the submission of Jesus himself, that he would die. Gethsemane was the direct answer to Eden. And it was the start of a new created order. And that brings us then up to Easter, to another garden, the garden tomb. To our passage today, because the persons of the Trinity are not done yet with the garden story. Jesus had the victory on Good Friday. He took the, the full effect of the loneliness and the estrangement of Eden upon himself, as we looked at in our Good Friday service. And in his resurrection, which we're celebrating today, he applies that victory to you and to me. Because the master gardener placed himself in that tomb, and he was placed there as a seed is placed in the ground. And seeds, of course, in the hands of a master gardener sprout into a magnificent crop. They sprout into the church. They sprout into us this morning, into you. You are the crop born from the seed of the garden tomb. And I love how the first little bud that we see in this great garden of the church is a woman. It's Mary Magdalene. And again, if humans were making this story up, you would never give this role to a, to a woman. In first century Palestine, a woman would not be considered a respectable or a reliable witness in a court of law. And yet, Jesus comes to her first. It's beautiful. And yet here we see her depicted, as St. Augustine referred to, uh, to her, as the apostle to the apostles. And if we put ourselves in this woman's position that Easter morning, she was not waking up like we all did, with joy and anticipation and excitement. This woman was one of the only people who, along with the disciple John, did not leave Jesus at the foot of the cross. So she was either a woman of incredible courage, or she was a woman of such sorrow and so overcome with loss that she just didn't care about herself anymore. And I tend to think it's the latter. And maybe some of you out there know what she felt like. Maybe you have spent a night in sleepless misery. Maybe you have lost a loved one, or you've been betrayed, you've been hurt by someone. Maybe you have come to the place where you have cried to the point that there are no more tears left, just a silent emptiness. And this was the state of Mary that morning. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So as she got there and saw an empty tomb, or an open tomb, this had to have been like a twist of a knife in her heart. They can't even let his body lie in peace. And so she runs to tell the disciples, who in turn themselves race to the tomb in bewilderment. And after they have gone, she looks into the tomb and through her tears sees two figures who ask her why she is weeping. And you can almost hear the raw passion in her voice in the text. They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And then she turns away. And there's really great drama in this passage. She sees someone, and it's Jesus. But she doesn't know it's who it is because her, her tears are so thick. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And I have to wonder if there wasn't maybe a, a little smile playing in his eyes or at the corner of his mouth as he waits for her to recognize this. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. She guessed that he might be the gardener. Don't you just love it? Because he was. 
Jesus, the master gardener. Jesus, the agent of all creation. Jesus, the seed. Jesus, the promised one. Jesus, the steward who succeeded in the garden where her father Adam had failed. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And I think we need to pause for a moment because something really remarkable has happened in those verses. Some of the, I know some of the greatest moments in my life have been when my family has expanded. When I heard the minister say at my wedding, Mr. and Mrs. Brooke Mose. When you, when you look down at your newborn child and you name them, when we adopted our other children and the, the judge who herself was crying pronounced their new name, beautiful, beautiful moments. And up until now in the Gospels, you can, in, the, in the Gospel of John, you can look back. Jesus has free, frequently spoken of God as the Father or the Father who sent me or my Father. And his disciples have been called followers. They've been called friends. They've been called servants. But what does this verse say? But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Things are different here. Creation is new. There's a new relationship. Like a little Easter rosebud on the, uh, on the arbor in the garden has sprouted, Mary and the disciples, they're part of a new world, a better Eden where they have a new relationship with God. And it's a family relationship where they can know the Father intimately as Jesus knew the Father. Jesus is the gardener, and he's the seed, and he's her brother. And the church of God, made up of Jew and Gentile, has become the true Israel of promise, invited into the true promised land, following the true Joshua and the true David. So brothers and sisters, the point is that the church is the true garden. And by church, I don't mean a building. None of us are in a building right now. We're, we're meeting in cyberspace. But we, you and I, the body of Christ, are the true resurrection garden. We are the new creation. And so we see that the garden plan all along was not Eden. God wanted to show us more than his creativity and his goodness. He wanted to show us his justice as he punished his son with the full force that our sins deserved. And he wanted to show his mercy as we are united to Christ and forgiven and adopted as children. And he wanted to show us his grace as we realize that nothing in ourselves accomplished any of this from start to finish. And this Easter, if you are one who is united to Christ, you are that resurrection garden, a garden where the will of the Father reigns supreme, a garden where the work of the Son reigns supreme, a garden where the Holy Spirit once again hovers over that which was once dark and formless and void and barren and lonely and grows fruit, beautiful fruit that will ripen throughout your life and that upon your death will be raised like Jesus incorruptible for an eternity of blessing and worship in the promised land. One is nearer God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on the earth. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great story of Scripture. We thank you, Lord, for the many ways that we can look at it. We thank you for the beautiful pictures of the garden that we see from Genesis to Revelation. We thank you, Lord, that you are the gardener and that you are working powerfully in our lives, in our hearts. We thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you have sent to indwell us, to water and grow the fruits. We ask, Lord, that we would be faithful as we walk before you now and always in resurrection triumph. Amen. Well, for our hymn of response, let's sing together in Christ alone.
Philippians 3, 20 through 21. It's a great passage about our resurrection at the end. For our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. This is written to the Philippians. And Caesar Augustus, he established the Roman colony, colony, uh, colony of Philippi after the battles of Actium and Philippi in AD 41-42. And he established these colonies by settling veteran soldiers there. These were Roman citizens um, and colonists. They were, um, the intent was that they would extend the range of Roman influence throughout the Mediterranean world. And they weren't just there waiting to get raptured back to Rome at the end. They were there to colonize. They gleaned their strength from Rome, but they worked and lived in Philippi. And I think the metaphor is obvious, and so then is your charge. Glean your strength from, set, from heaven, where you are a citizen. That's where Jesus reigns from. But he will return to this earth and then remake it. So live and work with authority here in whatever town you've been placed. The kingdom may not be of this world, but it is definitely in this world in a mighty new creation Easter kind of way. And so this week, you are charged to be effective and committed colonists. God's benediction, John 20, again, 19 through 21. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit.